If you ever thought about getting a successful mentor or coach and you actually want me, Spectacular Smith, to actually coach you and become your mentor, I'm actually so excited about releasing my online school, Spectacular Academy, where I'm actually going to teach you live once a month different skill sets that's actually going to help you change your life for the better transformational information that I'm going to give you guys access to. I have a formula to success that every single company that I ever touched turned into gold. And I have over 14 companies. Okay. And all of them have the same type of success. So I want to teach you everything that the school system should have taught you. You know, everything that I know and how I built these fast growing companies and these award winning companies and show you real curriculums that I'm going to break down. You're going to have access to me. I'm going to be live in the chat rooms. I'm going to be live in the Facebook groups and personal communities that I'm going to give you guys access to of like minded entrepreneurs. So you're not by yourself on this mission. Not only you have me as a coach and a mentor, but you actually have your peer to peer people that's going to push you and root for you on the way to the top. Guys that's on the same exact weight limp that you are on and want the same exact results because my game plan is to change the way the school systems teach and teach you the things that need to make an impact in your life. Things that's going to be a high ticket skill that you can use forever where you don't never have to worry about going broke or not eating at night because once you learn how to market and brand yourself then you can eat for a lifetime you get access to my team and everything if you want to go to my free training just to get a sample of the things that's going to be in my program you can actually go to specmentorme.com or i'm gonna put it in the bio only take a certain amount of people every single month so reserve your seat and do not procrastinate because you might just miss out. Now let's get to the podcast. What's up, everybody? This is Spectacular Smith and welcome to the Spectacular Experience. Every week we try to bring in someone special, someone who has brought soul back and I'm really excited for this one. He was part of the highest grossing R&B and hip hop tour of this year. Um, and he's done some big things outside of the music industry with his company, Adwazar. So I'd like to welcome Spectacular Smith from Pretty Ricky. What's going on, Spec? Hey, man, everything is fine, man. I appreciate you for having me on the show. For sure. So we want to talk about definitely Adwazar, but let's start off with some Pretty Ricky because I know we have a lot of readers that have followed you guys since the beginning. So, and I've been meaning to ask you guys this for a long time. On the song Your Body, whose idea was it to have Yes Sir chanted all over the chorus? Was that you? Yeah, I think that I said the Yes Sir one time and it was like, oh man, I think that sounds dope. So let's add more Yes Sirs in there. So we just pretty much just kept putting them over and over again in the hook. So as we was making it flow, we just felt like the ending of the hook should have the yes sir on the end. So it was it was a pretty strong record, man. From the first time we created it and finished it up, we knew it was a hit. Yeah, for sure. And I saw you guys perform it on the Millennium Tour and everyone was reacting to it very strongly. But let's talk about this Millennium Tour for a bit. Um, It's been a while since Pretty Ricky has really hit the road. I know you guys have done some spot dates here and there, but what was that like for you to get back on the road and, you know, be a part of such a big show? For me, I don't know about the other guys, but for me, it was really nerve wracking at the beginning because we came up with all new routines and it was something that we never did before. And I'm a perfectionist when it comes to my craft on stage and things like that. So I just really wanted to make sure I was coming in strong so I was I was pretty nervous, man. I was pretty nervous because it was dance moves. I, I just was learning, man. And with anything, just doing something for the first time all over again after not really being on in that type of uh, atmosphere and so long and, and that many people and so long, even though we was doing little spot dates and things like that, performing together, but we wasn't in a sold out arena every single night. So yeah, it was a little nerve wracking at the beginning, but 
once we kind of got through all the craziness and everything started rolling, everything was, was pretty smooth selling from that point forward. Right. And when you guys got the offer to be a part of this tour, because I'll be honest with you, Spec, you know, with our audience, when we had posted about the tour and the date, people were a little hesitant. Some thought it might be a little too soon for a tour like this. Some felt like, you know, you know, are they ready to really get back on the road? Because we haven't seen any of these guys in a while. We weren't even sure how successful it would be. But obviously, case in point, it did very well. So what were your expectations going into that tour? Yeah, honestly, I already knew what it was going to be. Once I heard that it was B2K and Pretty Ricky, I mean, everybody else was was definitely um, huge at the time in, in our generation. But I know for sure B2K and Pretty Ricky never shared the stage together. And I know how huge those guys was back in the day. And I know how big we were back in the day. So I felt like both of us together on one stage, I just felt like it was going to be pandemonium regardless. And then you have the rest of the guys who, who bring such a, uh amazing experience with their music to the Lloyds and the Bobby V's and Mario's and Ying Yang Twins and Chingy's. Like those guys had major hits. So just all that together, I just knew it was going to actually hit. I actually tried to do something similar uh, and do my own tour dates by myself with my marketing company and do the promotion ourselves because all the promoter really doing is re-putting an uh, offer in front of our fans who already love us and interested in us and sell tickets to our fans. So I felt like, you know, it was a challenge, but I felt like it was something that my company could accomplish putting the right package together. So I was already on that, but my brothers didn't really – understand or I feel believed or they just want to really more like uh, uh, the check up front. So we right. didn't really do it. And then millennial tour came and then it just showed how powerful it was. Like you said, it was the second high and grosses tour of the year, which is unbelievable. Right. And it's, it's cool because of course, nineties R and B fans, they love that era. And it doesn't seem like the two thousand era gets as much love, maybe because it still feels like it was yesterday. But what did you learn about that era and, you know, your time in the industry um on this tour? Because when you're going through it at the time you probably don't realize a lot of what's going on, but now that you've been able to reflect back on that two thousands era, what do you remember about it? I mean, it was a beautiful era. I honestly wish I could jump in the time machine just to go back and just vibe to that era and appreciate it more. Because I just feel like the music nowadays is not that, that and you know, that don't have that same feel as the music back in the day have. I just felt like it was more of a vibe. Uh, and I really miss it. So I, that's why I knew it was a huge need for what we was actually offering to the world for that, that, that era which was the 2000s uh, to the late 2000s, I felt like people was missing that, and they wasn't getting that in no tour, no place at all. So now when this came about, I felt like it was going to do what it did. So I was already a believer before it even happened. Right. And the thing with, with, with Pretty Ricky is your sound, which you guys kept everything in-house, which I think contributed to you guys being able to, you know, keep your sound and keep it strong. But you know, of course, you're very heavy into business and, and all of that stuff. So there's always an argument on our end with artists. Are they supposed to evolve with the times or are they supposed to just keep their core audience happy? Like, how do you balance the two as an artist? Yeah, I think that I think you do kind of both. I think you do your your old school vibe, you know, and then you you kind of like get up to date on what's going on. So you don't really get lost in the shuffle. But you kind of do both, right? And you and you kind of jumble it together, where it's basically both coming together and and making making that making that you know mesh in between both worlds. And and that's kind of what we did with our new music that's coming up. We took the old sound and we bring it current to the new sound, and it's still a pretty Ricky sound all together. So I, I think we, we we did pretty good with that with the new music that's coming. What do you think the key is to, because I've seen artists throughout the years who try to dibble and dabble into new songs uh, or new sounds and they end up alienating their core audience. Like, what's the key to making sure that the core audience is still happy? Yeah, I think don't go too far away from what your true sound is. Like, I still, I truly believe in that. 
Like, I don't believe in, you know, having a certain sound and then, like, totally, like, just so-called reinventing yourself and then everything just goes left and, and everybody's like, yo, what the hell? You know, I don't. Right. I don't like the new sound. Like I, I think it's too too new, which I fell in love with you for a certain reason. So I think that keeping that same vibe but just switching it up, right? It might be newer beats but the same texture, the same tone, like the same everything, but just like a different beat behind it that's current. Like I don't know, it's a it's a lot of ways to switch it up. There's no true formula for it, but I definitely think staying true to who you are and the sound that made you you, because I feel like the people who love it back then is the same people who would love it right now, but long as it feel fresh and new, people will always love who you are as an artist and that sound that you bring into the table. Right. Now, with this Millennium Tour that you guys em- embarked on, obviously there was a lot of nostalgia involved in that, and nostalgia is a great selling point, but um is it is it a challenge to sell them on something new when it's not nostalgia? Like, what's the thought process there? Because obviously you guys have sold. You guys went platinum, so you have a million fans out there. How do you bring them on board in 2019 with your music? I really don't think it's a, a battle. I think they're looking for us versus us right. trying to sell them. They're looking for us to sell them, right? I mean, I don't think that it's something that we have to convince somebody about. Like to this day, people are like pretty Ricky, when are you guys releasing new music? Like we miss y'all. We miss y'all type of music. Like I would love to hear Jay Z. I mean, uh, um, Ashanti and Ja Rule make a new album together, like, and, and have that same old school feel. Right. And you can, like I said, make it a little current, but still give me that old school Ja Rule and Ashanti. feel. I would love that. I would love a trick and Trina album with that old school, you know, feel that, with a little bit of new school, right? And uh, so I, I definitely love the way it felt back then, and I feel like that. It, I feel I really feel like it's going to come back around because everything comes back around. And right. yeah, I think it's I think it's going to come back around, and this tour show and prove that people are missing and want to jump in that time machine and go back to that feel good music from back in the day. Yeah, I'm with you. And a term that I really hate, but a lot of music fans in general use is dated, like a song sounds dated. And, you know, I think we need to get to a point where we can just appreciate a song for what it is. If it's good, then it's good, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, So you talked about this new Pretty Ricky album. I know you guys have been working on it for a minute. Is that actually coming out? Because I know it's been, you know, on hold for a couple of years now, I guess. Yeah. So with us is just really making sure we come out the right way, making sure everything is is what you was talking about earlier, making sure everything is the, the, the sound that we wanted, making sure we're not getting lost in that, and we're giving a quality product. Like everything we always did when we released music, we felt like if it's not a single, we don't want to actually even create it. Like we wouldn't even follow through with a song, and we felt like it wasn't single material. So... We're just taking our time with it, man. And uh, as soon as it releases, definitely the, the fans are going to love it. And I promise that. For sure. And Pretty Ricky's last album came out in 2009. I believe that's when you guys um, left the major situation and went independent. So, um, And that album didn't end up selling as well as your first two. So with that said, would you have been okay with ending the Pretty Ricky run with that album? Because I know you're on to different ventures now with your business, but in terms of Pretty Ricky, do you think this new album was necessary for you? Okay, yeah. So the one with Tipsy on it was was back, like I said, back then we was under management, which was, you know, my father at the time, and I he didn't really make the best business decision. So the, even the label we went with, you know, it really didn't fit Pretty Ricky brand, and we kind of forced it. We had the brand new member we was trying to add in and try to make it mesh, but in reality, it just never meshed together. And that's back to what what I'm saying now is making sure everything lines up correctly, the strategy, the music, you know, the partnerships on who we partner with, the touring, like everything has to go together. And that's why we're taking our time because I felt like the third album and what what we did and how we did it, I felt like we did we could have did it a lot better and we learned a lot of lessons from that third release. Right. Now, 
couple more pretty Ricky questions before we move on to what you're currently working on. But Static Major, of course, we celebrate him on this website, on this podcast, and you worked heavily with him on the first two Pretty Ricky albums. Um, give me a Static Major story. Um, I think the best Static Major story, what, it's so many, honestly, I can't even get one. Well, I would just talk about when we first met him. When we first met him, we was like cocky as hell, man, because we, we know we wrote all our hits. <laughs> And the, the label was actually trying to pair us up with a songwriter. So they gave us one songwriter. It was like a guy who wrote all Trey Song stuff. Uh, and we were just like, ah, we ain't feeling that, right? It was just like, nah, we good. We don't want no songwriters. And then uh, they introduced us to Neo. And we was like, ah, you know, I don't, you know, we, we don't, this time, Neo wasn't even who he was right now. But he was like, ah, you know, we ain't really, we don't want no songwriters. We'd rather write our own stuff, right? So we didn't go with Neo. And then they put us in there with Static Major. This is a hood guy. You know, he kind of, we, you know, it was like, well, this guy with this big old chain on with Louisville on his chain. It's just like, man, whatever, man. You ain't dealing with this guy either, man. I was just like, we just want to make our own songs. So the label call was like, man, you guys need to uh, just, just try it out, just see how you guys feel about it. It's like, man, we good. Like, we don't want no writer. We don't care about what songs he wrote, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, we ended up leaving or something, or he left or something like that. He was like, man, put him back in. So we ended up talking, and then, like, we just started making some bangers, man. We, we gave it a chance, and we clicked so hard. I mean, we had banger out of your body. We had Juicy. We had on the hotline. I mean, when he even – he had to beat the production for on the hotline. He was like, yo, let me let me play something for you. Let me play something for you. So he was like, all right, cool. Now, remind you. The album, the second album was completely done. We was finished. And Static came and I was like, let me play something for you. Let me play something for you. So he played the beat. I mean, we listened to that beat for three hours, just bopping our head like, ooh, like this, ooh, like it's going crazy. <laughs> like, yo, this beat. So we listened to the for like three hours, and then we ended up creating on the hotline, which was our literally our album was completed. So that was the last song on the album. And we was like, man, we're going to make this the single because the single was Love Like Honey before that. And then when that got created that night, we ended up making on the hotline the single. And um, and that was good. And then Juicy, when he played the beat for Juicy, he was like, oh, yeah. He said that the beat came on literally for like six seconds. And he was like, oh, I got something. I got something. He was like, can you make it juicy for me? And I was like, ooh. <laughs> That's hard. I was like, yo, that's it. And then we, we created Juicy. But, yeah, man, Static was the man. He was definitely the truth for sure. Yeah, for sure. And on the hotline, of course, people still play it to this day. So you guys have made some records that have had longevity. So shout out to Static and shout out to Pretty Ricky as well. For sure, man. Bless me. Absolutely. Sure. Now, Spec, let's talk about your adjustment from – being in the music music industry and, you know, having number one records to, you know, and it goes with every artist. There's an up period and then there's a down period. Um, what was that down period like for you? And and how were you able to, you know, uh, come come to terms with it and get to the point where you are now? Yeah, so the down period was me just really figuring out ways to maximize the opportunity I had in in front of me because a lot of people feel like, oh, it's over for me, and they kind of look at the glass half empty. And I'm an optimistic person. Like, everything that I see, I, I figure out what is the good in it. And the good was I was this guy who understood business, and I understood how to make one and one a five. I understood that. Mm -hmm. I understood how to solve problems, which was social media. And by me figuring out how to solve problems, I could figure out algorithms and I could figure out ways to use psychologic, psychological methods to get people to click follow or retweet or reply. And I use what I, what I knew people like and what will make people move. And I use that to build social media accounts. So I knew I had, a brain and I knew that I can utilize it in certain ways and I figured out how to make money off of social media. So I took who I was as a celebrity and I started connecting with individuals that I actually knew 
that had a massive audience. So once I figured out a way that I could make money on Twitter, became top five in advertising dollars out of 100 million users on the Twitter platform and created a cat called Grumpy Cat, which is now worth over $100 million. And once I did that, I kind of transitioned to helping out different celebrities who didn't actually know how to monetize their social channels and started signing them on. Once I had a system I could do at scale, I created a company called Awazar. I started bringing these guys on. I started making these guys $20,000, $60,000 a month and started crushing it for these guys. And when I did that, you know, I became one of the fastest growing companies in America with the Inc. 5000 list out of Inc. You know, they, Inc. Magazine put together the top 5,000 growing companies out of 18 million registered companies in the world. And I was our ranked number 262 on the list. So when I figured that out, I started really taking on these, these, these uh, artists, man, and kind of transition from artists to now I help personality brands and inspiring talent become famous on social media while telling their story to the world and increasing their network through monetizing their followers. And pretty right. much that's what we do right now, you know, and even, even launched the uh, brands too. Right. So they knew these brands knew I had a bunch of celebrities and they came to me saying, Hey, like I want to actually, you know, use your celebrities to sponsor my product or endorse my product. And we, we ended up doing um, Maddie J, one of my partners at the time ended up doing a, a campaign called the Dabbit Santa sweater campaign. And within the, literally from launch from zero from scratch, no product to 30 days out to launch. Uh, we ended up doing $1.2 million in gross sales and over $2 million in 60 days. So now we take that same proven strategy and formula. And now we help launch products for different e-commerce brands, uh, fortune 500 companies and really getting their product out to the masses. And, uh, and then we took all those formulas and, Everybody that I understood that, you know, couldn't afford, you know, doing a campaign with me for 35 k and up for influencer marketing campaign, I actually created an a, a academy called Awazar Academy where now I actually teach, you know, people who, who are aspiring entrepreneurs or guys who actually have a six-figure business, want to get to seven-figure businesses, and I'm coming in the game and really changing the way you actually learn, right? And having seven figure earners, guys who have eight figure businesses, ten uh nine figure businesses, teach in my program and teach these individuals on how they can do it themselves. So versus us doing it as an agency, we show you how to do it as an actual business owner or aspiring entrepreneur and you actually do it yourself and we teach you through uh, seven figure earners and my expert team and I'm teaching in my program also and we just changed the way you know people actually learn in, in this day and age right Steck, I think that's super cool just knowing that you came from pretty Ricky and you guys were on top of the world but you had to kind of start from scratch start from the bottom and climb your way back up um, and I know a lot of that has to do with checking your ego at the door and understanding you're going into a new business you have to learn and relearn again. Um, was that a challenge at all for you? It was definitely a challenge. It was a challenge because I was growing so fast as a company. And imagine like making 200 grand, right? 200 grand by yourself, just like running your own operation, not caring about nobody else to say, hey, light bulb goes off and say, I should do this for other people also. And then going from, $200,000 to $2 million within a year just because you just added on, let me help other people. And then Facebook changes something, and then 80% of your revenue drops literally overnight. And then you as an entrepreneur have to realize you have all of these employees now. I have 15 employees. I have a mortgage. I have car payments. I have a family. I have all these people that's dependent on me. So I decided to just self-learn, right? I didn't go to school for none of this stuff. I just went to Harvard after all the success. But before all this, I didn't have no education at all. I just graduated high school, and that was it, and became famous from uh, from music. But going into business, I didn't have any training in anything. I was 
talking to Puff, having a meeting with Puff, and he was asking me, he was like, yo, you did all this with no training, no, like, nobody, no education? I was like, nah. You know, everything was self-taught. Like, I literally, I literally went in and took every seminar. I went to every seminar. I went to every conference. I went to, uh, bought every program. I got consultants. I got mentors. I did mastermind groups. I joined the organization called EO. Um, I got an operational system called the Entrepreneur Operational System, which I, I talk, I teach in my program. And I had to learn all this stuff. Books. I read over a hundred books. And I had to, I had to grow as fast. My brain had to grow as fast as my business was growing. And yeah, it was, it was definitely a challenge just to answer your question. Right. <laughs> and, and with Adwizar, you guys do a lot, deal with, you know, you know, making sure that artists understand that their brand has value. And I think that's one of the challenges for consumers and, and music fans is what they feel like once the artist isn't in the mainstream or on the radio anymore, there's no value to that artist unless it's like a nostalgia tour or, or, or something like that. But what you're saying is there's there's actual value in an artist's brand? There's value in anyone who built a following, no matter who you are. If you built a following and you have a of followers that would engage with you, then you can turn that into money. If you really think about what even my company does, what any company does that involves influencers and marketing, these advertisers pay us, right? And then we pay the influencers to promote their product and they get an ROI on it. That's why I get paid seven figure, uh, seven figures and eight figures in campaigns every time I launch a campaign because they know that these influencers are going to give them an ROI, which is an turn on their investment. So if you as an influencer or celebrity or public figure, whatever you want to call it, was to create your own product and market to your own people, then you are able to see the fruits <laughs> and the benefits of you taking the time out and growing your audience the way you did, right, and all that hard work you put in and growing your audience. Either you're in the studio or you're on tour or you're doing viral videos, whatever you're doing, you're able to take that fan base and use it for your own business, right? Then having all these companies milk you out of your of your audience and then you only got paid that one time. If you look at Rihanna, right? Rihanna got her cosmetic line. She's one of the richest females in the world right now. It's not because of music. Right. It's because she took her own audience and she launched her own product and marketed it to her to her audience. That's why she became who she is. Right. Kylie That's Jenner, dope. she did the same thing. She she she's not Kylie Jenner, uh, the the boss and and almost a billionaire because she was just on Instagram all day. She grew this massive. She got all, she got attention, right? And once you got get the attention, you turn the attention into money and revenue. And that's exactly what she did. She turned her attention into money through a product, and it was her cosmetic line, the same thing, Kali Cosmetics or whatever she called it. And she turned that into an empire. And that's what these other people are doing for their own brands. But but the influencers themselves are not doing it for their brand. So I'm just helping these influencers understand that. I'm launching products for some of these influencers uh, or I'm helping these companies launch their products through influencers, but mo most of them, I'm I'm just showing them the value, and then I'm I'm getting the value out of it. So even if I'm launching products and you have ten products uh, that's doing a thousand dollars a day off of your audience, then you're making ten grand a day. You multiply that times thirty, you're making three hundred thousand dollars per month. Right. So that's the game. With, with that, that is the game. But, you know, I see a lot of people on social media, um, fake followers. How does that work with, with AdWizard then if people have fake followers or they're purchasing their followers? Because I see a lot, of, a lot of artists do that to make it seem like they're bigger than they are. How does that work with Ad AdWizard? So, so we don't believe in fake followers because if they're not engaging, then you just look stupid, right? If you got a million followers and you're getting 40 comments, like people are not dumb. The intelligent level is all the way up when it comes to social media. So if you actually right. have a, a page and you have a super low engaging audience, one, you look like people don't care about you. Two, you look 
you uh, people who see through you, you lose credibility because they like, oh, you bought followers, so it just makes you fake. So all that stuff, it makes you lose credibility. So we don't believe in fake followers. Everything with us is about organic growth and figuring out ways to connect you to your right audience so you can turn that into revenue, right? The whole goal is to get partner with us. We put a strategy behind you. We get you with the right team that's that's in-house of Alwazar, pair you up with the right team, and then come up with, you know, the right content that's going to intrigue your audience to want to follow you and nurture you throughout the process where they're actually going to want to do business with you, right? If you forcefully down and throat, sales pitch, sales pitch, salesy, nobody wants to support you. But if you entertain them, bring bring out emotion out of them and love and everything like that, or, or however you want to present yourself to the market, and then you, you put a product in front of them or you passively talk about a product or indirectly promote a product, they're willing to support you and, and reciprocate. It's reciprocate. It's like, I'm going to give you value and then return you know, if it's time for me to promote something, then you're, you're, you're more likely to, to buy, you know, and, and you right. base it on a percentage. It's like if I have a, a million people who follow me and only 10% engage, which is super high, I would say like 5%, right? But out of that 5%, you get 1% to buy. That's still a huge amount of money that can get created, and especially through the retention rate of having those different people uh, to be recurring customers for you. Right. Now, Spec, let's get back to Pretty Ricky for a second. In terms of the new, new music, as you're telling me about, you know, your business model and what you do, one of the challenges that I find with the music industry, especially for veteran artists, they'll drop a new song, they'll put it on Spotify, they might even post it on their Instagram page, but that's it. Um, what's your mindset and your mentality going into this Pretty Ricky album in terms of promoting it? How are you going to reach the people? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> That's easy. Definitely challenges, doing doing different challenges, you know, getting getting the kids involved from TikTok to uh musically and and getting influencers involved, getting the blogs involved and getting everybody involved that connects with the culture. And once you do that and you have a hit record behind that, it's, it's game over. Right. <laughs> Now, how much of that, because it sounds like you guys have a plan, when we talk to other artists, they don't really necessarily have a plan in place. Is that just due to lack of awareness of what's going on in social media? Or, you know, what do you think contributes to that? I think is understanding business. This is a business. And if you want to execute right. on anything, you got to have a goal and uh, you got to have goals and plans and projections in place. So I see it as a business. That's why, you know, guys like Diddy and Jay-Z and, and all these guys are moguls. And that's exactly what my name is going to be compared to once I'm finished with what the hell I'm about to do. And it just so right. happened that my group is a is a part of that, right? And and, right. and the guys in my group are smart as hell, too. So with all our powers combined and my know-how of social media marketing and seeing the way things are happening and and the space is nothing that I I can't do, and there's nothing I can do for my own group because I'm a part of it. So sky's the limit. It's really about how hard everybody really want to go. Like my game right. plan is, which which is not even my game plan, which is going to happen within the next year or two, we're going to launch our own tour successfully, and we're going to have sold-out shows, and we're going to do it our damn self with no promoter. Right. So <laughs> Exactly what's gonna happen. Jay Z gave you the blueprint. Diddy gave you the blueprint. It's there. If you broke down what Jay Z did to get his billion dollars, he had a product, right? He had a product. Do say he had Ace of Spades, which is two products. All right, three hundred, three hundred and ten bill, uh, three hundred and ten million, a hundred million for Do say. Boom. Next thing is you have a streaming service. Streaming service is there. That's a digital product. Simple. Create your digital product. You got it. Now that's residual coming in digital. Then the next thing he did with his whole touring, he did touring, he partnered up with Live Nation, he figured out the ropes, and then after that, he launched his own stuff, which is Rock Nation. And that's he did his own tours by himself without no promoter. Right. right. So yeah. he everybody's giving you the blueprint is if you want to follow it. And a lot of times people try to do things once it's already done but you have to pick and choose on what you want to do. Like right now, I don't feel like nobody could come in 
and do a champagne and just get the same success Jay-Z did with his champagne. I feel like that wave is over with. You know, not saying that somebody can't slip through the cracks and go viral and get the type of success he got, but I feel like that's already over with. You know, one of my best mentors taught me uh, when when you actually – when when everybody is going and you go to, you already missed the train, right? You want right. to go when everybody's not going. Uh, you want to catch it before everybody else catch on. But if everybody's doing it right now, you're already too late. You know, Warren Buffett taught me that. You know, and right. and he, I don't know him personally, but just the, just to be, you know, studying an individual, reading his books and watching them online, that's that's a mentor, right? And uh, and a lot of people think they got to know people in person or personally to have them mentor them. So it's a quick jewel for everybody that's listening. Right. Nice. Uh, you know, one of my favorite videos that you've posted on social media, it's been floating around. It's one where you talk about empowering your staff and just giving them the ball, letting them run with it. And of course, I'm sure you right. did that when you were on the millennium tour, you were on the road a lot while the rest of your team was working. But when it comes to pretty Ricky, what do you think you've learned from the corporate world that, you can apply to, you know, the group because as oh, opposed to Adwizar, who you're the CEO, in Pretty Ricky, you're just one-fourth of it. Right, right. So, yeah, it's, it was pretty hard at the beginning. It's still kind of hard at some times because I was always a quiet guy in Pretty Ricky. I never really cared about music. So, for me, I just really stood the background and I really never said nothing at all because I just felt like everything was going to get handled. So now this time around, it's like if I'm putting my energy and effort into it, I know how much I make for an hour of my time, right? If I take how much money I make and I divide it into 24 hours and each hour is worth a certain amount of money. So I know how much I'm worth, right, per hour. So I know if I'm putting my time and energy into this, it has to equate to my my work. Like it has to be worth it. So for me, I try to really come in and structure things the way I know how to structure things and bring what I'm good at to the table because I know about systems. I know about structure. I know about marketing. I know about, you know, a lot of things that we didn't have before as Pretty Ricky because everything was kind of ran a little bootleggish because my father was a street guy and he really didn't have any training on business or things like that. He was a smart hustler, but it was never right. – structure as a real business. So I just try to, you know, I came in and structured it as a real business, you know, from the way, uh, from, from everything, from top to bottom, from credit cards to accounting to, to way we move and operations and, you know, uh, accountability and, and like getting better every single time, having meetings before and after and strategizing and goals and I basically help with all that stuff, and 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 uh, Baby Blue is good with that. Pleasure is good with that. So everybody has their own thing that they bring to the table. Like Pleasure, he's a really good people person. Every through this tour, I learned a lot from each person in the group. Slick, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from Pleasure on like you know how to take care of people and and, and networking and partying and like how to party the right way. Like I didn't know it was a strategy to party. And Pleasure kind of right. has that figured out on how to throw a party and, and make sure everybody good and the networking. And, like, I never really got into that type of stuff, but he taught me that. So if I ever wanted to do that, I, that's there. And then Baby Blue, you know, he's a real good strategy guy. Like, he can figure out, you know, different ways and, and make you think about different different things in different ways and have a different perspective on on things. So And he's real, like, detailed. So everybody taught me uh, a few things, man, and I think just together as a whole, we make a, a great team outside of music on the business side. But me coming in and structuring it and putting my t even putting my team on it to make it run smoother. Right, and Sec, I'll tell you what. One of the most frustrating things for me, and I can't really blame the artists, but a lot of my favorites, they they just go on the road now. They just do shows. They don't even bother with the new music because you know they feel like. Why bother? Who cares? But like for you, you're not only going to be recording new music and hitting the road, but you're doing this while you're making a lot of money with Adwizar. So what's the motivation behind bringing back the crew and bringing back Pretty Ricky? Well, the motivation is, is, is back to business. We went to Justin Timberlake tour, and he's making $1.5 million a day. Every single time he hits the stage, he makes $1.5 million. And I know we're not 
there yet. And I know we can be what he is. So until I get there, I know I'm basically sacrificing until it's that time because I know that time is coming. So it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because we should be on the road every single year. We should be on tour every single year. That's just what it should be. And I believe that. So I know we have the music, I know we have the fans, and I know we have the business smarts to be a live nation, to be a rock nation. I know we could be that. So I understand that. So as a businessman, I sacrifice up front, and I'm going to make it back on the back end. That's dope. And finally, Spec, last question for you. And I'd like to ask this to all you know, guests who join us on the podcast, which is, you know, do you remember the time when you first realized that, you know, your music career wasn't just for fun anymore, that it was an actual career? That was when, really it was up to now. Ever since then, it was just fun because I really never got paid for my mm. music. You know, my father was handling the funds. We put all our money together. He made some bad business decisions and kind of, you know, left me flat broke. So I never really, I never really cared about money. I always had my side hustles. Like I was, I was in elementary making, you know, selling ten thousand dollars worth of candy in third grade, right? And I, and I had my middle school story, you know, selling candy. So I always had money. I always had side hustles. I was doing Twitter accounts and things like that, and making money off the side. On I was top five in advertising dollars on the whole Twitter platform, a hundred million users. Like I didn't care about pretty Ricky money. I never cared about it. I always did it just for fun. My passion was in performing on stage. And when I used to, when I perform on stage, that's where I get my rush. That's where my love uh, connects at, and my my love tank gets filled from that. But other than that, you know, when I got back into the whole situation and I realized that okay, now my father's no longer handling things. We have to not only replace him, but fix the things that we could have did better when he was running the, the group, and now create that business structure. So. Long story short, when we got back into this whole thing and after me having a successful business, uh, I kind of understood that, you know, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's make sure we're putting the best of the best on the team. Let's make sure we got the best security. Let's make sure we got the best road manager. Let's make sure we got the best um, manager. Like our manager is, uh, is uh, Brooke Payne, right? He, mm. he, found it, uh, he found it new addition. You know, he manages SWV, he manages, like, you know, all these, you know, huge, iconic groups. I felt like he understood groups, so pleasure brought him to the table, and we hired him as management. I brought Neo Road Manager to the table, Toast, Santos. You know, Santos came to the table, and boom, now we got best of the best. Now we got the best uh, security. So everything has to be top-notch, from the stylist to security to road manager to bus drivers, to dancers. Like, we have a phenomenal dancers, the best of the best of dancers that mesh with us and, and our style, our vibe. So once I realized that, I was like, okay, the way I build the team for my company, we need to come and build the same exact type of team for this whole situation, and let's go crazy. Nice. So, Spec, that's it for uh, for us on the podcast. We're out of time, but... Um, the Pretty Ricky album, and I know you're going, you guys are hitting the road again soon. When's that all happening? So right now, everything is in talks right now. You know, either we're going to partner up with a label. Uh, we have some huge labels that's, that's having conversations with us. But I'd rather just put together some top five marketers, and we just go crazy together, and everybody put their money where they mouth at, and we do some real marketing strategies and just go crazy. That's really my game plan. But, you know, I still got three other brothers. I got to agree to it. So we still figuring all that stuff out, man. You know, I'm all about ownership. Right. <laughs> that's definitely a good thing. So, Spec, that's it for this uh, this episode of the podcast. I appreciate you for joining us. And, you know, we'll always support Pretty Ricky, Spectacular, AdWords, or everything you have going on. So just keep it going. All right, man. For everybody who's listening, if you, ask, if you actually want to listen to my podcast, I have the Spectacular Experience, which is the number one rated podcast in the Apple Music Store. I mean in the in the music section on uh Apple Podcasts. So just check me out, download it, subscribe. Um, you know, I try to drop a podcast every single week and uh talk about entrepreneurship and 
and interviewing some top of the line people, man. All right, cool, Spec. Best of luck with everything and take care. All right, peace. Thank you.